This is an entire sermon in and of itself. And this is really deceptive and really important because this is how many people will try to backdoor works into salvation. And ultimately, what is point four? We're going to go through it the same way I did the other points this morning. We're going to look up the passages he's trying to use to support his argument. I'm going to explain why his arguments are wrong. We're going to see all the scripture on this. But what, what it has to do with, it surrounds believers having works and like having those works kind of be evidence. And the, the big problem with this is when people are looking at your works for salvation, you know, it's what, what is your salvation based on? I mean, is it based on your works? Then it would make sense if you're looking at works, if your salvation is based on your works, to look at the works. Inherently, lordship salvation is based on works. That's what they, they teach. That's what we saw this morning, which is why they're so focused on the works. But we need to be careful and look out for all of this, you know, so-called fruit inspection where people are looking at people's works to determine whether or not a person is saved as opposed to their belief if it's truly your belief that saves, then isn't the natural thing to look to see if someone saved is, well, hey, where is your faith? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, obviously, people can lie. We know that. But if you want to know what someone believes, you ask them. Amen. If you're going to look at a sinner and, and identify that they're sinning, well, you've identified that they're a sinner. Congratulations. I don't care who you're talking to. I don't care if you're looking at uh, John MacArthur himself. Guess what? He's a sinner. And if you look at his life close enough, if you're allowed to get close enough, you're going to find all kinds of wickedness in his life. But he doesn't want you to see that. I'm sure he doesn't want to be inspected the same way that he's saying that, oh, well, you're going to have this, you're going to have that. We're going to look at this, and, and, and I really, we're just going to spend a lot of time because... Um, Mainly on this point, there's a couple others I think I'm probably going to get to, but um, this is the one I really wanted to make sure we got through. So we're going we're gonna to tackle this one uh, this evening. Now, his fourth point, excuse me, starts off by stating, Scripture teaches that real faith, right? And I'm adding the quotes. Real faith inevitably produces a changed life. Now, as with all of his writings, it's extremely deceptive. So you could word things in a way where it's like, yeah, that's true. But it depends on your definition of the words and what you teach about that. Do I believe that real faith inevitably produces a changed life? Yes, I do, because real faith produces a born again spirit. There is a new that that is in. I mean, you want to talk about changed life. You have a new spirit. So yes, that is an, a very significant change, very powerful change. I mean, having that new man to be able to please God and to do all kinds of things through the power of God, yes, that is significant. A significant life that, that exists now in a new believer. So yes, we believe in a changed life, and yes, you have to have you know, real faith. I, I, I mean, as opposed to fake faith, I guess, is what, what it would be, but that would just be a liar. I mean, faith is faith. We don't need to, to qualify it by saying real faith. Faith is faith. You, ha you either have faith in Christ or you don't. Right. Right? If you have faith, it's real faith. But see, he wants to put real faith on there because he only considers real faith as if you can see you doing works. That's right. Otherwise, it's not real faith. 